Thank you so much for uh, inviting me here to be part of this lecture series. I've had great fun this summer participating in different events that the ICAA had put together. I did a part of the series for the In Your Neighborhood and was able to show off the little town in upstate New York where I'm here quarantined and enjoyed preparing for this one. So when you all initially asked me to be part of this series, I wanted to try to make sure that in some way I didn't just talk about our work, but I maybe brought it to the issues that we're all struggling with now and the issues that academic institutions are struggling with. And in a sort of casual conversation with one of our clients for the building that you see the title slide for on the screen, I was talking with her about how and when they were planning to send students back and how they were going about making those decisions. And it just occurred to me that that particular design was actually quite a bit more suited to a situation where you might have to quarantine people or separate groups of students than maybe some of our other academic projects were. And so that's where the idea for this really came from. I think we're all struggling, schools are struggling, trying to figure out how to teach remotely, how to keep students engaged, what to do with their housing. And it just seemed like an opportunity to talk about all the different work that we do. So we do a lot of different uh, residential types of projects. We do everything from apartments to single and double bedrooms with shared bathrooms, lots of different styles of residential work for different colleges and universities and secondary schools around the country. And it just seemed like this was a good opportunity to actually take three of those projects and profile them a bit and talk about each of them to me represents a sort of different scale of privacy afforded to the student, which in this particular time equates to an easier situation to manage if you're an administrator and you're trying to figure out how to get your students to social distance and you're trying to figure out how you're gonna quarantine students if they get sick. And so it occurred to me that looking at these buildings through a new lens, because none of these decisions about the planning of these buildings, of course, were made with this crisis in mind, but looking at these things through a new lens would actually help us to learn something that we might be able to apply to this current situation that actually doesn't just come from responding to a crisis, but comes from responding to different cultural and student needs that have been emerging over the last 10, 15 years anyway. So the first project I wanted to talk about are new residential colleges that we just finished at Yale called Benjamin Franklin College, which you see in the foreground, and Pauli Murray College, which you see in the background. And this was a new project for 950 beds and for a real expansion of the student body at Yale. Yale had come to know that they were starting to reject as many qualified students as they were accepting, and they really wanted to offer the Yale experience to a broader group. So this was part of that plan to really make them feel part of the campus. And the Yale campus, as many of you may know, is very much centered around this idea of residential colleges. It's where the students live for all four years that they're on campus, and they are all modeled on the Oxford and Cambridge colleges, and they are all built up against the street and have a series of internal courtyards inside of them. And this comes from a long tradition at Yale. For many years when Yale first started, there was no student housing. And then the administrators realized that the students were really losing out on some of the social aspects of being on campus. So they made a more concerted effort to start building some housing, which started with a building called the Old Brick Row, which you see here on the screen which faced outward towards the city, towards the New Haven Green, and was comprised of a simple groups of rooms off of a shared stairway. As this developed over time, it grew into this idea of an entryway model with suites that included both bedrooms and study rooms. And this became the model that Yale has used really ever since. Slowly but surely, these transitioned from freestanding buildings like Connecticut Hall that you see on the left to buildings that started to form courtyards but still faced the street, like Vanderbilt Hall, which you see on the right. And then, of course, the students at that time took great pride in decorating their rooms the same way that students today coordinate with their roommates and make sure that they have a pleasant place to be living. But sometime in the early 1900s, Yale decided to change things even a bit more. They wanted more housing for students. They felt again that not everyone was able to live on campus. And so James Gamble Rogers was hired to design the Memorial Quadrangle, which was really the first building that fully took on this 
Oxford, Cambridge enclosed courtyard kind of persona. And the way that James Gamble Rogers went about designing these buildings was very much the way that we approached designing the two new residential colleges, which was first, as you see on the left, to figure out what the residential module was going to be. So what was the type of suite going to be? In this case, it was two single bedrooms with a study and off of each stairwell, there was a shared bathroom that the students would use. And then he also was working from the outside in. So thinking about what was the shape of the site? How was he going to make the light into courtyards? How was he going to plan out variation of heights across the site and fit the right density of residence rooms? So you can see here with highlighted in yellow all the stairs that these buildings, even though they encompass the whole site and they really build out to the street line, they don't face the street. All the residence entries face inward and there's no continuous corridor that links the interior of the building. So everywhere where you see a set of yellow stairs here, it's really like a bunch of townhouses that are strung together. And this became very much the heart and soul of the living experience at Yale, that your friends become the people who are vertically distributed with you along your entryway and not necessarily the people who live next door. And this is what that college turned out to look like on the inside. They all have a combination of large courtyards and smaller courtyards. And then after that, that was a very successful project for them. So that was 1917 to 21 when the building was finished. The students really liked it. It became very successful. The donor decided that he would like to encourage Yale to continue the college system and actually do it even more the way that Oxford and Cambridge did. So not only as a residence hall as the Memorial Quadrangle had been, but also to include dining and to include faculty housing and to include some seminar rooms and library space so that each individual residential college was a living learning environment of its own. And then in the 1930s, just after the start of the Great Depression, Yale built out another 10 of these colleges. So in less time than it took for us to build our two, they built all of the rest of these colleges on the rest of the campus. It was a really transformational building campaign for the school. And then this became the residential module or the residential experience of Yale students from that time forward. They didn't really build anything else until Aerosarinen came along in the 1960s. And Aerosarinen came along and built what are called Morrison Styles Colleges over by the Payne Whitney Gymnasium. And the interesting thing about these buildings is that Aerosarinen had gone to Yale and he had lived in those James Gamble Rogers buildings. So as much as these seem to be a, quite a stark visual departure from the collegiate Gothic and Georgian residential colleges on the rest of the campus, these were really taking a lot of the same cues from James Rogers. He was very interested in this kind of scenographic quality. He was very interested in this asymmetries, forming courtyards, using a material that would be similar creating high and low areas, towers that mark the skyline, all the same principles are at play in these buildings, including the sort of entryway layout. So you can see here a plan of these buildings with their yellow stairs. The big difference here was that the colleges from the 1930s had become very overcrowded. What you saw as a module for two single bedrooms sharing a living room had turned into bunk beds in those bedrooms, sharing a living room, and students were feeling like they wanted more privacy, they wanted more space, and so they asked for singles. They didn't really want the suite layout that had been so traditional at Yale for so many years. And so Serenin was hired to give them single bedrooms. So even though this had the same entryway concept, it was all based on a single bedroom kind of living module, which in the end, students came to dislike intensely, and I, I think made contributed to um, students not really liking the living experience of these colleges as much as they might have enjoyed some of the others, although many students will attest to enjoying the architecture of Saarinen and enjoying the quality of these rooms, as you can see in these old photos were actually quite chic in their mid-century way. Yale then went on to contemplate another college after the admission of women, not necessarily just for the women, but I think it was instigated by that. 
And this was a project I mentioned Jerusalem in 1972, which fortunately never got built because I feel like unlike Eros Sirenin, this firm was not really thinking about how to integrate, as modern as it may have looked, they weren't really thinking about how to integrate the residential college type onto this site. You can see it didn't really have enclosed courtyards. It didn't really have that same entryway system kind of feel to it. So fortunately for New Haven and for Yale, I suppose it was never approved. So that was the only experiment that they had with new residential colleges since Saarinen's time. But when Rick Levin became president in the 1990s, he really recognized that those colleges from the 1930s really needed a revamp. They, many of them had not had regular maintenance for many years, and they had a lot of issues. So he launched a major campaign to renovate each and every one of those colleges over a series of over 13 years. And in addition to renovating the historic spaces, they also took over the lower levels of those buildings and in places where there had been mechanical rooms that were no longer necessary or places where there had been squash courts that were no longer regulation size. They turned those into more modern recreational spaces for the students. They also had to address another interesting thing, which was that that entryway module with the two suites sharing a stair doesn't meet modern fire codes. So you can see here with the blue arrows, everyone can get into their suite, but there's not necessarily two ways out of a suite. So they really had to think through and made some modifications so that students could get out both directions, which did involve quirky fire doors in people's living rooms and things like that, but they were able to make this work to meet current codes. Here in Timberlake did something similar when they worked on the Saarinen residence halls, they actually were able to reconfigure all those singles back into suites. So it became something that was a lot more interesting to the students, I think, because they could have that same experience of having suite mates in these now nicely renovated modern buildings. Now, we faced a different problem. So this shows you the kind of residential module that we came up with. And our problem was that the way they did it on the 1930s colleges when they renovated them is not allowed in a new building. You can't pass through someone else's suite to get to your second means of egress. Nor is the way that James Gamble Rogers initially did it, nor was the way that they did it in Morrison Styles. So we had to come up with a different sort of idea. And at first Yale came to us and they really wanted to explore going back to that original memorial quadrangle suite layout where the bedrooms were singles and they wouldn't overcrowd them, they wouldn't put in bunk beds. They wanted each student to have their own kind of single private space, but they wanted them very much to still be in that social unit of the suite and to still have that feeling of being off an entryway. So what we were able to do to meet modern fire codes, but also to make the building handicapped accessible was to create this residential module, which you can see the bottom floor plan is the ground floor because you have to come in and then get up half a level to get into the first floor of residence rooms. And then the upper plan is the upper floors. And it shows how basically we kind of joined together two entryways with a short corridor. We came to call this diagram the fantasy bar because it actually doesn't play out in exactly this way anywhere on that kind of quirky triangular site with a full floor of grade change. Along the way, Yale actually made the decision to put in some double rooms. And this was really interesting. They did this a little bit as a cost savings measure. There's a lot of talk along the way of you know, whether part of the college experience is learning to live with another person, and that at least in some years, freshman and sophomore year, it's important to be able to have that experience. And it's part of becoming an adult, part of learning to socialize. So in the end, we did end up with a mix of a few suites that had all singles, a few suites that have a combination of singles and doubles, whether they were for first years or upper classes. And those were mixed up all around the site in different configurations. And in configurations with as few as two students and some that were really special places with double height living rooms or up in a tower with a view or maybe a duplex of some kind with as many as eight rooms. And this is what the inside of those rooms looked like. Yale very much wanted to keep them 
certain degree of parity with the existing residential colleges built in the 1930s. So they got nice hardwood floors and we were able to have bay windows and window seats and things like that. But they're also very sustainable because uh, they have operable windows and natural ventilation, which of course is nothing new. They also have a passive ventilation system, heating and cooling system, which is what you see above the windows there, which is called the valence system, which is highly sustainable. This is how the site was organized, and it is basically the two colleges are arranged so that each one has a large courtyard where they have commencement. So the, the college is really where you spend your academic career. It's an important part of your social life. It's part of your commencement exercises. And then smaller courtyards, which is where the various residence rooms enter onto. Each one has its own dining hall, and those share a loading dock and a kitchen, an underground connection, so that they share one kitchen. And they each have their own libraries, so places where you can study. And they also each have a head of college house. There's a faculty member who's sort of responsible for the social development of the students and to be the leader of this academic community, and they get a house for themselves and their family, which we'll talk about in a minute. This just takes you through some of the nice pictures, but it shows some of the outdoor social spaces and also the walkway between the two colleges. It shows you a little bit what the large courtyards feel like and the scale of those large and small courtyards. All of these are centered around the main social public spaces, which are the dining hall, which has a series of alcoves off of it, and the common room, which you see to the left and the library, which is above the servery. This is where the students take their meals. And each dining hall, each college has a different sort of character. They're designed to feel a bit like fraternal twins where they, they work off a similar DNA, but they each have their own personality, both on the exterior and the interior. So this is the Benjamin Franklin dining hall and common room. The library. And then in Holly Murray College, it works slightly differently. We have, instead of little alcoves off the dining hall, we have a separate room which can be used for events. But basically, it works the same way. You have your place where you get your food. The dining hall here has a little bit of a different character, more of English Gothic, less classical, more inspired by luncheons. This is their library, which has a kind of Oculus skylight in the center. And then down below, there's a series of social and event spaces and different amenities like dance studios and theaters, which are shared both between the two colleges and in some cases across the campus as a whole. Then we have the, the uh, two head of college houses. They each have a face on the courtyard inside of the college, but also along the street. So they can receive visitors from either location. Again, they're sort of fraternal twins who work in repair. And these houses are really unique and interesting. They look quite large for the head of college and their family. But the truth is that in plan, they really are part of the social space of the college on the entire ground floor. So the bulk of the ground floor is really events. They have lectures, teas, dinners with the students. And so they're all designed to have a flow for parties, large and small. And it really becomes part of the center of the social life of the college. And here you see some pictures of Benjamin Franklin on the left and Polly Murray on the right. So you get a little sense of how the character of these two colleges are just a little bit different from each other. But again, very much in keeping with the historic colleges on the Yale campus, really wanting to make sure that these colleges, which were located a little bit further away from the center of the campus or where Yale students feel is the heart and center of the campus, really wanting to make sure that these students felt like they were part of Yale as a result. So there's a family kitchen and also a catering kitchen and even a butler's pantry that's actually designed to help facilitate those big parties that they have at different times of year. So then we moved to China and a different kind of project. So this is Schwarzman College, which was a project that we completed around 2018, and it's at Tsinghua University in Beijing. 
and it's a very different kind of place. It's not for students who are undergraduates. This is for students who have won a very prestigious fellowship, a fellowship that's based in it, that's worldwide. So it's based on the premise that it's important to meet people from all across the world as you're developing as a professional to build relationships. The students here range from age say, 21 up to age 27. Many have had jobs in the past. Many have maybe come from the military or something. And so they're really in a different place in their lives. And so part of the idea here was to build a space that would give them the kind of privacy that you might expect when you're that age, but would also force them out into the public spaces and out into their common rooms to a place where they could really form tight bonds with their classmates. The campus is a very interesting one. It actually was built by an architect. Most of it was built by an architect named Henry Kelly Murphy, who was a Yale graduate. And it was built in the sort of late 20s, so around the same time as some of those early Yale college buildings that I showed. And parts of the campus look very American. I mean, this, this could be in Illinois if you look at it quickly. And so he used the language of classicism, he melded that together, and also took some influences from some of the more historic buildings on the site, which had originally been part of the Summer Palace in Beijing, which are now administrative buildings, and some of the early school buildings that were built before he arrived, and really kind of came together with this more classical language that mixed some buildings of red brick and then some of the older buildings of gray brick. Tsinghua also had its period during the communist times when uh, they actually call this the Russian style, when they built a lot of really big overscaled, very boring buildings. So we were trying to come back to that, something of a proper scale, something that actually built on both the traditions of Henry Killen Murphy's work and those early Chinese buildings and maybe I.M. Pei's Fragrant Hills Hotel or other buildings around and around Beijing and around China that we felt were influential and really tried in terms of the planning to bring together ideas both of Chinese house planning, which is often around courtyards where there's an increasing amount of privacy as you make your way through the courtyards towards the back of the building, but also thinking about Oxford and Cambridge at the same time and how those living and learning environments work and how they might translate to China. So this building is organized around two courtyards. It's organized around a front entrance courtyard, which is closed off from the street and filters you into the building. There's a main forum in the center, which is the kind of heart and soul of the social spaces of the school. And around that front courtyard are the library and the dining hall, which frame that courtyard. And there's a sunken courtyard in the back and around that sunken courtyard are the administrative functions. The courtyard is sunken because the university really wanted us to take advantage of the building capacity of the site, which was pretty limited in what we could do above ground, but not so limited in what we could do below ground. So they wanted to take advantage of that. We wanted to make sure though that things like the classrooms and the programs that we put down below, even two levels below ground, could get some sense of natural light at night and day. And this also includes, in addition to all of those academic spaces, actually also includes faculty residences at the front of the building and all the student residences at the back. This shows you a kind of typical residential floor and how those rooms are organized. So you can see here, the alternating colors indicate single bedrooms for each of the students. And the pink color indicates common rooms that they share. The purple color are stairs, so think of them kind of in the same way that you can think of those Yale entryways. People are vertically integrated in terms of their social units here. And these were grouped in groups of eight. So eight of these single bedrooms actually connects to a pink common room. They are all interconnected because of the way that the Chinese building codes work, but more or less they can function as a group of eight, they can function as larger groups. They're all connected by these common rooms, but each student has their own bedroom and their own bathroom. It's a small room, so it's not to encourage you to stay in your room, but it's a little bit more like a traditional hotel room. You have your own bathroom, you have your own closet. It's got a lot of built-in amenities and storage. And then those rooms 
come together as a community in the common rooms, and then also those students come together in some of the main public spaces that you saw in the diagram. So this is what those rooms look like, very heavily built out, almost like a cabin on a ship, taking advantage of every bit of storage space. This is what those common rooms look like. There's a small kitchenette, but they don't really take their meals here. It's more for coffee and tea and study breaks and things like that and really a place to study and socialize. The faculty apartments range in size from small studios to more important uh, spaces like this one, which is for the dean of the school or a director of the school and includes enough space to really host events and entertain. And this is what the building plays out like across its site. You enter through the gateway on the street into the entry courtyard, through the doors of that more public courtyard, into the forum, which is the place that really brings everyone together. It's a double height space, so it very much connects to the upper levels where the apartments and some of the residence rooms are. It also connects down below. Out into the courtyard, there's a space at the first level, and then you can see the space down at the sunken level where the classrooms are located down below library spaces, food service spaces, dining spaces, which are crucial to the community when in building community in good times, might function a little differently in times like today. There's a pub in the lower level. There's a variety of different classroom types from big flexible rooms that divide into smaller spaces to more classically fit out horseshoe shaped classrooms, which come again from a sort of Harvard Business School type, let's say, to other social and other social spaces down below. So the last piece that I wanted to show is actually a building that was never built, but it sort of pushes this idea of increasing levels of privacy for individual students even a little bit further than that example in China shows. And this was a project that really was based on the idea of what do you need to build to kind of teach students how to increase their level of maturity and independence and really get ready to launch into life as an adult. But how do you do that in a way that gives them the personal space and independence that they would like to have, but also continues to offer the kind of shared social spaces that really build community for a college community? And so something we explored as a precedent for this work was this interesting project called the Arcade. It's in Providence, Rhode Island. And it was a historic shopping arcade that in 2013 was actually renovated both into a shopping arcade below, but on the upper floors into a series of micro apartments. And so we thought we'd take this idea of the micro apartment and apply it to this project for the college. And so each of the room modules in this case, even though they're quite small, again, are fitted out with a lot of built-ins and furniture to increase storage. And in this model, each student not only has their own bathroom, but also their own little kitchenette. So really you can be quite self-sufficient. The furniture could be proposed these various kind of clever Murphy bed type things that you can get where you can have a bed, but also a sofa. So in a small space, you can have a lot of different living arrangements. And we propose that these groups, and we study different sizes of groups here, but we propose that these groups be organized around a shared great room, we were calling it, which would be a social space where students could meet and study, would also have a large kitchen with some refrigerated lockers. So if they wanted to cook meals together, they could have a bigger space to eat together and cook together. Maybe even a place where they could have cooking lessons. Part of the other ideas that the school had in this case was to address the issues of wellness and mental health. And so part of the idea was that also there could be cooking classes, there could be other amenities for the students that address these kind of growing problems on college campuses. And the interesting thing was that this module wasn't just something that we made up, it actually came from a lot of what we saw in their historic buildings on the campus, which were these 
kind of traditional residence halls with little singles along the corridor and shared bathrooms, but also these really nice great rooms that looked out right. over the landscape. And so what we did was just take that same idea from the historic buildings, but update it and change it in this way that it gave the students a little bit more privacy. And you can see how, when I think about this module, I can see how this actually would work really well in a time like today where you have a certain group of students who are living together, maybe in a group of 20, 25, maybe they consider themselves a bit of a family, they have their own private space, they can still socialize in a relatively small group. If someone is sick, then you have to quarantine the group. And I could even see a situation where how online education could work in a way that's really beneficial for the students. I mean, a lot of schools have been really challenged right now because, you know, on a dime, they turned to doing remote teaching. But remote teaching is not the same as really dedicated, thoughtful approach to online learning. And when I think about online learning and what colleges maybe could do or could learn from this situation, you know, it's obvious that bigger classes are probably going to go by the wayside. There's not much reason to sit in an auditorium with 500 people. But there is a lot of reason to have a professor who's really guiding you through discussions and really leading smaller classes and teaching you how to deal with all the information that's thrown at you as a student and formulate your own opinions about it, kind of on the Oxford and Cambridge model. So it's a funny thing when I think about technology, I also think that maybe it will drive us back to the original model of college learning, which is more of the tutorial method where there's a very small group of students working with a certain professor. And so when I look at this module, I can also, in my mind, imagine ways that it could incorporate a classroom or two or a seminar room or two. And all of a sudden you could have these smaller groups of students and have a way of managing teaching and learning and living where you could do what you needed to do based on the health and health conditions. And so for this project, we experimented with a couple of different ways that it could lay out on site, but also with the idea of wellness in hand, we thought about programming the exterior spaces as well. So being in a warm climate, this gave us the opportunity to think about the indoor rooms, the layout, but also these outdoor rooms. And you can see here, our buildings are in this sort of dark terracotta, our proposed buildings, existing buildings are in the lighter orange, and so I hope you can see at the top of the site plan there some of those historic buildings and how the shape and scale of our buildings were very similar to those, even though they were rethought on the inside, and how those groupings of buildings create these outdoor rooms, which were heavily programmed. They had outdoor recreational spaces, like a pool, it starts to look like a resort, places also for indoor and outdoor exercise in this living community more meditative spaces like water features, really also teaching students about sustainability and agriculture. So we propose maybe there could be an early citrus grove, something that we teach them about landscape and food, fun things like a fire pit and game patio, a garden where they actually could grow some food for their, for their kitchens and learn how to cook. And then also more meditative spaces like a labyrinth, or a meditation garden, or even an outdoor gathering space. And this is a few pencil images of what our initial ideas for that looked like, really kind of expressing the living rooms, the great rooms, and how they happen across the site for each smaller community of, of residence rooms in the micro apartments. and set up views out to the lakefront site, set up views out to the lake. So that's where I leave it. I have on the screen here three kind of residence modules that I showed. So the Yale module, which has suites, like either single or double bedrooms with shared bathrooms down the hall. The Chinese model, which has single bedrooms with bathroom in the groups of eight with other social spaces. And then the last, the micro apartment unit, which is the really giving, maximizing the privacy, but in a very small space and creating small living communities together. So I hope this will engender a good discussion. Thank you. Thanks for attending.